In this lesson, we are going to learn how to find power series representations for a whole variety of functions. In the previous lesson, we were able to find power series representations for sort of special functions for which we could use the geometric series. And we'll be able to do this for all different kinds of functions that are not for reformatable in the geometric series form in one way or another. So the questions we want to answer is which functions have power series representations and if they do, how do we find this? So the first thing we do is we suppose we have a function that can be represented by a power series. So suppose we have a function f of x that can be represented by a power series. And that means that we can express f of x in this form some number c0 plus c1 times x minus a to the first plus c2 x minus a to the second plus c3 x minus a to the third, etc on some interval, so x minus a less than r. We do assume that r is not equal to zero. So you have some non-zero radius of convergence. And the whole power series just says you can kind of express this function as a, an infinite polynomial. They shouldn't really say that because they're not polynomials because polynomials are actually you know, finite. But yes, that's kind of what we mean. Now the question is, is what are these? constants, because I've made them very general. First constant, constant, the coefficient of the x term, coefficient of the x minus a squared term. How are those constants related to f? So how are the c sub i constants related to f? And well, the first thing you can notice is that if you plug in a, every single term zeroes out except for that first one. So f of a equals c sub zero. So this first constant is f of a. And then we can take this expression and take its derivative, because we know that we can differentiate power series and the radius of convergence remains unchanged. So the derivative of c naught is zero. The derivative of c one times x minus a is just c one plus we'll have 2c2x minus a to the first, plus 3c3x minus a to the second, plus next we'd have 4c4x minus a to the third, etc. And notice that now if we plug in a, every term, all these guys zero out, and f prime of a is that c sub 1. So this first constant is c, c naught is f of a, this c1 is f prime of a. And let's continue to take derivatives to find the pattern for the other constants. And the second derivative will also have the same radius of convergence as the first derivative and therefore the same radius of convergence as the original function. c1's derivative is zero. We'll have plus two c2 plus three times two c3 times x minus a now to the first, plus 4 times 3 c4 x minus a to the second, etc. And notice in this case when we plug in a, we get that the second derivative at a is equal to 2 c2, which implies that our c2 constant, our co that coefficient, is the second derivative at a over 2. And what we're going to do is just continue to do this. Take the third derivative. We'll just do this two more times because you're going to see the pattern then. The third derivative will be 3 times 2c3 plus 4 times 3 times 2c4 x minus a to the first now plus a whole bunch of other stuff that's also been differentiated but I don't want to write it every single time. In this case when you plug in a you get 3 times 2c3 
and that implies that C3 is equal to the third derivative at A over 3 times 2. And I didn't multiply that for a reason. What I wanted to point out is that 3 times 2 is actually 3 factorial. And similarly, 2, we could have really expressed that as 2 factorial. Okay, one more derivative. The fourth derivative. If you're sick of writing little prime signs, you can put a 4 in parentheses, and that means the fourth derivative. Okay, that will be 4 times 3 times 2 c4 plus other stuff, and that other stuff will have a's in it. Notice when you plug in a, everybody zeroes out except for that 4 times 3 times 2 c4, which implies that our c4 is the fourth derivative at a over 4 factorial. And hopefully by now you're seeing a pattern. <coughs> So the fourth coefficient, or the coefficient of the x plus a to the fourth power, is the fourth derivative of your function divided by 4 factorial. The c3, the coefficient of this thing to the third, is the third derivative over 3 factorial. Coefficient of the second, second derivative over 2 factorial. This first one is really first derivative over 1 factorial, because 1 factorial is 1. And this one is the zeroth derivative, or the original function, over zero factorial. And remember, zero factorial is defined to be one for various reasons, probably including this one. So we have proven the following theorem. So if a function f has a power series representation at a number a, <clears throat> then the coefficients cn are equal to the nth derivative at a over n factorial. And this is called the Taylor series of the function f at the point or centered about or about or centered, so the point a. So at the point a, about the point a, centered at the point a. That all means the same thing. So here is that sum written out sort of in non-summation notation. So the Taylor series representation, if a function has one, will be given by f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a, and that's over 1 factorial, plus second derivative at a over 2 factorial times x minus a squared, plus third derivative at a over 3 factorial x minus a cubed, etc. So that's the sort of what this would look like when we plug in this for the c sub n's, sort of expanded or just written as a sum, not in summation notation. Now, there is often a special case. We often take a to be 0. And when we take a to be 0, this is called a Maclaurin series. And in this case, that summation notation becomes f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x minus 0, or just x, plus the second derivative at 0 times x squared, don't forget, over 2 factorial, plus third derivative at 0 over 3 factorial times x cubed, etc. In summation notation, that's a sum from n equals 0 to infinity, the nth derivative at 0 over n factorial, times x to the n. So let's find some Maclaurin series for some common functions. So the easiest one is e to the x. So remember from the Maclaurin series, you assume that that a value is 0. Then we have the Maclaurin series is given by f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x, plus the second derivative at 0 over 2 factorial times x squared, plus the third derivative at 0 over 3 factorial x cubed, etc. So what you're going to have to do here is find a pattern for the nth derivative, and e to the x pretty much is as easy as it can get. No matter what 
derivative you have, the first derivative of e to the x is e to the x, the second derivative is e to the x, the third derivative is e to the x. So the nth derivative of e to the x is e to the x. And now this says that we have to input 0 into all those derivatives. So the nth derivative at 0 is e to the 0, which is 1. So that can be written as 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the third over 3 factorial, etc. Or in summation notation, as the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, x to the n over n factorial. So that is the Maclaurin series for f of x equals e to the x. We're also supposed to find its radius of convergence. And just to note, what we really want to do is say that this equals e to the x. And we will be able to establish that, but it's a, there's a little bit of a technicality here. We assumed that if a function f, so if f has power series, then this is it. And proving that, so we have to show that this actually is it, because maybe it didn't have a power series representation, and then this thing actually isn't it. The cases where that occurs are pretty special, and you're probably not going to see many, if any, in this class. But we want to say this is equal to e to the x, and we will be able to after some technicalities. Okay, now we're going to find the radius of convergence of this power series. So to do so, we are going to use the ratio test. So find the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio of the n plus first to the nth terms. That's going to be x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial times n factorial x to the n, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of absolute value of x over n plus 1. And that will equal 0, which is less than 1 always. Therefore, your radius of convergence is infinity. And the interval of convergence is negative infinity to infinity. Now, if we can say, if we can say that this power series representation is e to the x, it could let us approximate various values of e using an infinite series. So, for example, I said to give an expression of e as an infinite series, notice that e is the same thing as e to the first. So I can take that infinite series expansion and plug in 1 for x. That gives me the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 1 to the n over n factorial, or just the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of 1 over n factorial. So here's an idea. You could approximate e by finding a partial sum for that series. If you want to convince yourself that that's probably true, you could just, you know, just take a calculator and add up 1 over n factorial from like 0 to, I don't know, 10 or 20 or 1,000. You're going to get a decimal approximation that is getting close to 2.71 the more digits you add, or the more, the larger your partial sum is. Okay, so after e to the x, the next easiest function to find a Maclaurin series for is sine of x. And that's because the derivatives for sine have a really pretty simple pattern. So, so the original function is sine, and so f of 0 will equal 0. The derivative of sine is cosine. So f prime of 0 is equal to 1. The second derivative is negative sine. So the second derivative is 0. The third derivative is negative cosine. So the third derivative at 0 will be negative 1. The fourth derivative, we're back to sine. And so the fourth derivative at 0 will equal 0. And then we're going to cycle again. The fifth derivative will be 1. The sixth derivative will be 0. The seventh derivative will be negative 1. 
as you can see, f 2n of 0 is going to equal 0 always, meaning the even derivatives are always going to be 0 because they're always going to be plus or minus a sign. All right, so the Maclaurin series here will be, so it's the general form is f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x plus the second derivative at 0 over 2 factorial x squared plus the third derivative at 0 over 3 factorial x cubed, etc. And all of the terms that have an even derivative are going to be 0. That first one is 0, the second one is 1, next one is 0, then we'll have negative 1 over 3 factorial x cubed, and you can surmise that what comes next will be positive x to the fifth over 5 factorial, minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial, etc. So x minus x cubed over 3 factorial, plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial, minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial, etc. To write that in summation notation, you have to have a way to only give odd powers. So first, we'll put in a negative 1 to the end because this series is, is obviously alternating. And the power on the x needs to always be an odd number. So how you do that is you use some variation on 2n plus a number. Now 2n plus 1 works here as long as I start my sum at 0. And the denominator is 2n plus 1 factorial. I'm going to skip proving the radius of convergence here because the proof is extremely similar to the radius of convergence for e to the x. The radius of convergence will also be infinite in this case, meaning this series converges for any x. So you could find a Maclaurin series for cosine using the same method of the previous example, but I think it's actually easier to notice that the derivative of sine is equal to cosine. So if I differentiate the Maclaurin series for sine, I get the Maclaurin series for cosine. So cosine x is the derivative of sine x, and written in expanded form, that sine x was 1x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial, etc. And the derivative of, one, of x is 1 minus 3x squared over 3 factorial plus 5x to the 4th over 5 factorial minus 7x to the 6th over 7 factorial, etc. And notice that if you have 3 over 3 factorial, that's the same thing as 3 over 3 times 2 times 1 which is 1 over 2 factorial. So here we'll have stuff that simplifies 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth, 5 over 5 factorial will be 4 factorial minus x to the sixth over 6 factorial, etc. Notice how sine had all of the odd powers and cosine has all of the even powers. Also notice with cosine that when you input 0, you get cosine of 0 is 1. When you input 0 into sine, sine of 0 is 0, even using this power series representation. So this in compact sigma notation form is a sum from n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n over 2n, the quantity factorialed. You have to put that 2n in parentheses, otherwise it's 2 times n factorial, and that's something totally different. Now, much like how we did in the previous lessons, you can find Maclaurin series for functions like this by multiplying your known series by the x squared. So this could be written as x squared times the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial, which becomes the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x squared times x to the 2n plus 1, 
over 2n plus 1 factorial. And I want you to always combine terms that can be combined using exponent rules. So here, those exponents are going to add because we have a common base. So your final answer will be the Maclaurin series for this f of x is negative 1 to the n x to the 2n plus 3 over 2n plus 1 factorial. You find the same thing if you did repeated derivatives, but that's a lot harder. It's much, much easier to use your known series and then multiply it by x squared. And this one's sort of similar in some sense, except for I have e to the 3x instead of e to the x. So what that means that you can do is you can just input 3x for x in the function, the, the Maclaurin series expansion for e to the x. So that's x times the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, 3x the quantity to the n over n factorial. Well, that's the same thing as the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, 3 to the n, x to the n times x over n factorial. Or simplified slightly, it's the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, 3 to the n, x to the n plus 1 over n factorial. All right, so here's that technicality warning, and we're only going to do this once, but it's good to have done. So technically, when we found the Maclaurin series for the function e to the x, we found we want to conclude that e to the x is this. So we established that if this function has a power series representation, that it is this. But how can we determine that the function has the power series representation in the first place? Or under what circumstances will the function equal its power series? So, so to establish that this function equals its power series expansion, or any function does, we have to show that the partial sums approach the function f. So we must show that given the power series representation, the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, nth derivative at a over n factorial times x minus a. So given this, we want to show that the nth partial sum approaches the function f of x as the number of terms you goes to infinity. And this nth partial sum is going to be a Taylor, what's called a Taylor polynomial because it's a sum of n things. And so since it's finite and we've got stuff to powers, we have a sequence of polynomials. So here's what we do. We define what that partial sum is, so Tn. This will has to be a sum that ends at n, so I have to use a different letter here. I'm just going to use i. It's what your textbook used. So i equals 0 up to n, the ith derivative at a over i factorial x minus a to the i. So what that is is f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a up to nth derivative at a over n factorial x minus a to the n. So it's just the sum of the first n things, which is a polynomial. So we know that f of x is the sum of its Taylor series if the function f of x is the limit as n goes to infinity of these nth partial sums. Now when you do a partial sum, you leave some stuff off, specifically the stuff from n plus 1 off to infinity, and that stuff you've left off is called the remainder. So we're going to give that a name. We're going to call rn, that will be the function, minus the nth partial sum, and solving this for t sub n of x, t sub n of x will equal f of x minus r sub n of x. And using this, if we can show 
that r sub n of x approaches 0 as n approaches infinity, then t sub n of x will approach f of x. So how we will show that these functions equal their Maclaurin series is we are going to look at the general remainder and we're going to show that that general remainder goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And that is what the following theorem says. So if you have a function that is the sum of its nth Taylor polynomial, so the first n things in that infinite series, plus the remaining things, then and if the limit of the remainder is zero, then you can say that your function f is equal to some of this Taylor series. So we're trying to show that that limit is zero for a function f of x, and when we do this, we often make use of the following theorem. Okay, so this theorem is a general way to determine an estimate for the remainder when you do a partial sum. We've had specific remainder estimates for two very specific tests. When we did the integral test, we had a remainder estimate. When we did the AST, we had a remainder estimate. This works for every series, even those that are not tested using those two specific tests. And so first, the hardest thing here is to dissect what all this stuff says. So let's just go through it. So you have this, the n plus first derivative of x is less than or equal to some number m on some interval. So if your radius of convergence is infinite, this d is taken to be some large number. But the idea is, is that the n plus first derivative is bounded. So n plus first derivative bounded by some big number. And then what this theorem tells us is that the absolute value of the remainder, or which is the same thing as saying sort of the error, is less than or equal to that bound over n plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the n plus 1, where a is the center and x is any general value. And you might be able to conclude that this thing goes to 0. Now your textbook proves this inequality and it uses repeated integration, so if you want to read it, you can. Um, we will use it some more to estimate error in a later section when we're talking about Taylor polynomials and determining how good those estimates are. So let's use this to prove that e to the x is the sum of its Maclaurin series. Okay, so we have our function f of x is e to the x. The n plus first derivative is e to the x. So for all n. So if we suppose that we have d is a positive number, so we need to find that m bound. And we know that x minus 0 is less than or equal to d. So the a is 0 in this case because we have a Maclaurin series. Then the absolute value of the n plus first derivative so think about what e to the x does for positive values. It increases. So if that's my d there, the largest value e to the x takes on is the value at the end, which is the point d, e to the d. So the n plus first derivative, which is equal to e to the x, is less than or equal to e to the d. And this is what you're going to take this to be m. So take this as your m. And the m will change based on how large your interval, what the point is, no matter how big d is, you can take this to be your m. Then from Taylor's inequality, we have that the remainder is less than or equal to m over n plus 1 factorial absolute value x minus a to the n plus 1. Plugging in our specific things, we have e to the d, which is just some huge number, over n plus 1 factorial x to the n plus 1, which is the same thing as e to the d times 
x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And here I'm going to pull out a slight trick. We want the limit as n goes to infinity of e to the d x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial to equal 0. The e to the d is a constant. It doesn't really matter. This part, we have to show that that's going to 0. And I actually claim you've already done this. Here's why. We showed that the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, x to the n over n factorial converges. And if a series converges, that means that the xn over n factorial had to go to 0. Remember that that wasn't enough for convergence, but it was required. So since this goes to 0, there's no reason that x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial also goes to 0. So thus, we have that this limit from above, we can really, really say that that limit n plus 1 factorial, that limit is actually equal to 0. And therefore, what we can conclude is that e to the x really is equal to the sum of its Taylor series. And I completely realize this is like really technical, and what we will do is we will use this Taylor's inequality in a later section when we do estimation and estimation techniques and applications. So for now, you can assume that the functions we're talking about do equal their Maclaurin series, but technically to prove it, you would have to use this. The kind of neat application is that we can use, we can actually find some sums exactly because we can think about them as Maclaurin series with specific values for x plugged in. So you see this over n factorial and something to the n, that looks a lot like, looks like the sum from n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial, which is equal to e to the x. It's just that it has x equals 3 plugged in. So it turns out that this series that you have is actually equal to e to the third. So what you're going to have to do is recognize that something is in the form of a specific function's Maclaurin series and tell me what number is plugged in. If you feel like it, you could go look back at some of the ratio and root test questions, and you can probably see that quite a few of them are series of this form with specific numbers plugged in. Oh, this one. Okay, well, you see that you have 2n plus 1 factorials, and that kind of hints off that this probably is going to be sine. So sine of x is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, x x to the 2n plus 1 all over 2n plus 1 factorial. This, for x, has x equals pi thirds plugged in. Do you see that right here? That's pi over 3 all to the 2n plus 1. So this is equal to sine of pi over 3. And if you look at your unit circle, pi thirds is this angle and sine is that side, which is root 3 over 2. Alright, sometimes I will not give you the series in summation notation, so you've got to, to convert this into summation notation yourself. So we have a sum from n equals 0 to infinity. There's a negative 1 to the n component. Then we have an ln of 2 to the n component over n factorial. And we can write that as the following. Negative ln of 2, the quantity to the n over n factorial. And now you see this is a lot like e to the x, which is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, x to the n over n factorial, with x equals negative ln of 2. So this is e to the negative ln of 2. And that is perfectly acceptable, like as in that is a correct answer, but this actually simplifies. So this negative 1 is the same thing as ln of 2 to the negative first power, which then the e and the ln can cancel, and you just have 2 to the negative first, which is a half. 
So yes, it's strange, but that series adds to one half. And the last one is from a previous section, but it is a series that you should know. So the difference here, you see that we have one, three, five, seven, there's no factorials. So hmm, writing this in summation notation, negative one to the n, definitely alternating. In the denominator, you have a two n plus one, and then a two to the two n plus one. And what this is, from a previous section, you had a formula for arctan. And arctan was equal to the sum from n equals zero to infinity, negative one to the n, x to the two n plus one over two n plus one. Your textbook has a list of all the common things you will know. We will also discuss that later, but this is what arctan looks like. So this thing is arctan x with x equals one half plugged in. And the reason it's one half is you can think that there was a one to the two n plus one in the numerator, but one to the two n plus one is just one, so they sort of simplified that away. So this really is arctan of one half. It doesn't work out nicely, but that's what that summation is. Now, so far we've only found the Chlorin series, and your question is as well, what if we want to find a Taylor series? So here is what a Taylor series will look like if your center is some value other than zero. And we should make the function a little bit more complicated. Let's make it e to the three x, so that the pattern of the derivatives is a little bit more interesting. So the original function f of x is e to the 3x. The first derivative is 3e e to the 3x. The second derivative is 3 squared e to the 3x. I didn't say it'd make the pattern hard, so that it'd make it a little bit more interesting. The nth derivative of x is 3 to the n e to the 3x. We want this center at x equals 2, so we must input 2 f of 2 is e to the 6th, f prime of 2 will be 3 e to the 6th, second derivative at 2 will be 3 squared e to the 6th, the nth derivative at 2 will be 3 to the n e to the 6th. Notice everybody has an e to the 6th, and then as the order of your derivative increases, you have even more powers of 3. So the general form for a Taylor series is f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus the second derivative at a over 2 factorial x minus a squared plus the third derivative at a over 3 factorial x minus a cubed, etc. So specifically here, that will be e to the sixth plus 3e e to the 6th times x minus 2, plus 3 squared e to the 6th over 2 factorial x minus 2 squared, etc. Or in summation notation, e to the 6th times 3 to the n x minus 2 to the n over n factorial. And we'll learn how to use these series to approximate functions in a later section, and we'll determine that series, Maclaurin series that are centered at zero, are good for approximating functions when you're near zero, and when you want to approximate something nearer to another point, you find a Taylor series centered about the point you want to approximate close to. So the final series we're going to talk about today is a binomial series. So how do you deal with 1 plus x to any power k where k is any real number? And we're going to give the radius of convergence. So the pattern here is simple. It's just that there isn't a great way for writing it. So let's find the pattern and the derivatives. So the first function is 1 plus x to the k. The derivative of that function is k times 1 plus x to the k minus first. The second derivative will be k times k minus 1, 1 plus x to the power of k minus 2. The third derivative will be k times k minus 1 
times k minus 2, 1 plus x to the k minus 3. You can kind of see where this is going. The nth one's a little bit tricky, but if you're able to dissect the pattern for, say, the third and second ones, you can get it. So it'll have k, k minus 1. The question is, when does it stop? So notice that this was the third derivative. This was k minus 2. So if this is the, and k minus 2, that is 1 less, that's 3 minus 1. So the last one here is going to be k minus n minus 1, and the 1 plus x will have power k minus n. And distributing that negative, this is k times k minus 1 all the way down to k minus n plus 1. I guess you could also think that this is k minus the number that is 1 greater than 3, so minus a number plus a 1. And plugging in 0, f of 0 is 1, f prime of 0 is k, the second derivative at 0 is k times k minus 1, the nth derivative at 0 is k times k minus 1 down to k minus n plus 1. And then so the Maclaurin, the Taylor, no, Maclaurin series is the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, nth derivative at 0 over n factorial times x to the n, And the nth general derivative is k times k minus 1 down to k minus n plus 1, all that over n factorial times x to the n. This is sometimes written like this, n over k in parentheses, and that's read n choose k. Now we're also going to find the radius of convergence of this series. So to do this, we're going to use the ratio test. So we find the limit as n goes to infinity of the n plus first term over the nth term. Okay, now the n plus first term, that will be k, k minus 1, it will include a k minus n plus 1, and then one more term will be k minus the quantity n plus 1 plus another 1, x to the n plus 1, all over n plus 1 factorial, multiplied by n factorial over k, k minus 1, down to down to k minus n plus 1, x to the n. And a lot of stuff cancels. So the only thing that doesn't cancel in the numerator is that last term, which is k minus n. Notice how the 1's cancel. We're left with an x, and then we're left with an n plus 1 in the denominator. And notice that k is just a constant, and 1 is a constant, so we have now as the limit as n goes to infinity of absolute value of x times k minus n over n plus 1, also absolute valued. Since k is a constant, this thing goes to 1. So this approach is absolute value of x. And this will converge if the absolute value of x is less than 1. Thus, this radius of convergence is 1. So now let's find a Maclaurin series for a specific binomial function, for a specific power function. 
So first, rewrite this as 9 minus x to the power of negative 1 half. And the Maclaurin series that we found was for 1 plus a number, so the first thing that you've got to do is deal with that 9. So how we're going to do that is write this as 9 times the quantity 1 minus x over 9, all to the negative 1 half. And the 9 to the negative 1 half is 1 third. So we have 1 third times 1 minus x over 9 to the negative 1 half, which is the same thing as 1 third times 1 plus negative x over 9 to the negative 1 half. So we're going to use that binomial series with k equals negative 1 half. So we're going to actually list the terms here, and then we're going to talk about how to simplify them. Now, the general binomial series for 1 plus x to the k is 1 plus k times x plus k times k minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared plus k times k minus 1 times k minus 2 over 3 factorial x cubed, etc. We are using k equals negative 1 half and instead of x, we're using negative x over 9. So our function f of x will equal 1 plus, so k is negative 1 half, x is negative x over 9, plus negative 1 half, negative 1 half minus 1 is negative 3 halves, over 2 factorial, negative x over 9, the quantity squared, plus negative 1 half, negative 3 halves, negative 5 halves, negative x over 9 to the third over 3 factorial, etc. And then simplifying these things slightly, we'll have 1 plus x over 2 times 9 plus 1 times 3x squared over, and here's one of the tricky things, is that this dividing by 2 factorial, when you simplify that, you multiply by 1 over 2 factorial, 1 over 2 factorial. That 2 factorial joins those 2's in the denominator. So in the denominator, I have a 2 squared, I actually also have a 9 squared, and I have a 2 factorial. The next term will be also positive, so plus 1 times 3 times 5, x to the third over 2 to the third, 9 to the third, 3 factorial. You can see what the next term is going to have. It's going to have four of these guys and then a negative x to the fourth. So you can see that this actually is going to have everybody being positive. Maybe we can write this as one sum. So, so we obviously have a 2 to the n and a 9 to the n. In the numerator, we have an x to the n. We also have an n factorial. The only question is, how do you get that whole only odd things? So the way, so we need that to be one when x is zero. Hmm. Well, one when x is zero and one when x is one. I think that repeating makes it a bit if not impossible, at least complicated to try to do it in one. So I think I'm going to have to adjust my series, but let's just give this a try. So if we do 1 times 3 all the way up to, say, 2n minus 1. So then when I plug in 1, the only number there will be 1. When I plug in 2, I'll have a 1 and a 3. The only problem is actually when I plug in 0, I get the wrong thing. So the way that we can fix this is we can change this sum so it begins at n equals 1. You just have a plus 1 on the end. And that's how I've seen it written in various like web assigned things, is they will tell you to start the sum someplace 
else other than zero and then have you add on the terms you can't make fit in the nice summation notation. If it were me, I might just, if that was going to happen, I probably would tell, it to you, tell you that you would have to do this so you wouldn't be struggling so much trying to make it fit into one compact sum as opposed to two pieces.